Welcome back, my beautiful friends. You're listening to A Moment of Zen right here on 710 WOR, the voice of New York iHeartRadio. I'm your host, Zen Sams. Up in my Healthy Minutes segment brought to you by Revere Securities, we are featuring Dr. William Solomon, founder and CEO of the Accreditation Council for Medical Affairs, ACMA. He's considered by many to be a pharma industry futurist and is often featured over many media outlets. Fox News, Forbes, Al Jazeera, that's just to name a few. He has over 20 years of experience in the pharmaceutical industry, working within medical affairs across corporate America, government, and Congress. He received his PhD from Columbia University. Today, we're chatting about the ongoing opioid crisis in America, how psychedelics and cannabis may be used to treat mental health disorders, neurological disorders and addictions, and the priceless education the Accreditation Council for Medical Affairs is providing the pharmaceutical industry. Opioid abuse is a multifaceted problem that impacts national security, economic stability, cybercrime, and public health. The opioid epidemic is overwhelming law enforcement, addiction treatment centers, and emergency responders. In addition to the abuse of prescription drugs, accidental overdoses from illegally produced drugs laced with fentanyl, a deadly synthetic opioid that can be 100 times stronger than morphine, continue to destroy lives. The Center for Disease Control and Prevention estimates more than 1,000 emergency department visits and about 91 opioid overdose deaths every single day across the country. Drug and alcohol addiction in America is a very, very serious thing. There does seem to be a silver lining. Psilocybin mushrooms are no longer just the stuff of recreational psychedelic trips. In the past years, they've received a lot of attention for their medicinal potential. Yes, magic mushrooms may now be curing alcoholism, while herbal medicines have been used to treat mental health disorders since ancient times. Many of the medications used in contemporary medicine originated from plants. Salicylic acid from the willow tree, for example, and morphine from poppies. Numerous botanical treatments are useful in general psychiatry. And a recent study published on Yale Journal shows that cannabis provides immediate relief for symptoms of depression and other mental health issues. CBD is also an essential component of medical marijuana, and it's derived from the hemp plant. It's been credited with numerous health benefits and has even been touted as an effective treatment option for many difficult medical conditions like childhood epilepsy. Here to chat some more and give us perspective is my expert at hand, Dr. William Solomon. Welcome to the show, my friend. Hi, Zen. Very uh, nice to be here. Thanks for having me. Nice to have you on. Okay, let's start with the opioid crisis. So uh, we talked about this once before. Dope Sick, it's limited series on Hulu. They recently highlighted the crisis very well, um, Dr. Solomon. Until 2010, heroin's chemical cousin was readily available across the country. This is the, the little known story of the prescription drug OxyContin and how it's linked to the greatest opioid epidemic America has ever seen. What is going on? You are an insider. Did big pharma go out of their way to keep people addicted? What, what are your thoughts? So I, I think that it's a multifaceted issue. So to peg it only on big pharma, I think, you know, it's, it's leaving a big portion of the story out. Uh, but when we talk about the, the pharmaceutical industry in particular, and I worked in the pharmaceutical industry for over 20 years before, you know, becoming an entrepreneur and leading the ACMA. And what I could tell you is that most people in the pharmaceutical industry, they're trying to do the right thing, okay? They're trying to do the right thing for patients, but you always are gonna have companies where you have executives that are really focused more on profit over patients. And I think in the case of the opioid crisis, what happened was big companies like Purdue Pharma, like Johnson & Johnson, J&J and others, they saw the dollar signs and they saw that ultimately you can potentially use this product, oxycodone, in a chronic way. Remember, you know, originally these opioids were used for patients who had, you know, really terminal stage, end stage cancer. So it's really used for severe pain. But what they ended up doing was, you know, mischaracterizing the use of the drug among healthcare providers and physicians and telling them they could use it for chronic pain. And while in the beginning it was able to deal with the chronic pain issues that patients had, ultimately, of course, it led to addiction. So I think companies probably knew this to some degree and they misrepresented the data that was given to physicians and physicians you know 
they they only know the data that's available to them from you know given to them by the pharmaceutical companies. So I think physicians probably play some role because they probably should have done a little bit more due diligence and really looking at the evidence at hand for opioids in that population. Um, and I think the other area are pharmacies. We don't talk about that a lot, but pharmacies, big pharmacy chains, Walmart, CVS, Walgreens, um, they've been investigated by several state attorney generals and their role in turning a blind eye to patients that clearly were addicted to opioids. So again, it's a multifaceted problem. I think though, moving forward, you know, us as, Amer as the American people and the public, thinking about the trust that we have in the pharmaceutical industry, what do we do now? So what do we gotta do moving forward to prevent another opioid crisis, right? Because the opioid crisis is kind of one area that we tend to focus on now because obviously with the epidemic, but there's other drugs in other areas where there's a lot of misinformation out there. Okay, so yeah, definitely that Purdue Pharma uh, made a huge impact. It was a big, uh, big scandal and big fiasco. We'll touch on that in a second. But OxyContin uh, dominated the market during the first year uh, it was released back in 1996. Uh, it made 45 million in sales, William, uh, for its manufacturer, Purdue Pharma. And by 2001, that number rose to over $1 billion annually. So this manufacturer, Purdue Pharma, uh, was based in Connecticut, and it was a pharmaceutical company that was really on the rise because this new product was introduced in such a, uh, in such a saving grace kind of way for these patients that were facing a lot of pain. Uh, but they, but Purdue Pharma, William, went on to, to it, they went to every length to distribute their drug. They specifically targeted physicians who didn't necessarily have adequate training in pain management, encouraging them to prescribe it as a first choice, even when the patients didn't need such a strong drug. So definitely um, accreditation companies like yourself that are there to educate and regulate are extremely important. Now, the ACMA is most famous for the Board Certified Medical Affairs Specialist Program, uh, which is the first and only board certification for MSL and medical affair professionals in the world. And the ACMA also has the first ever prior authorization certification specialist program to help streamline healthcare insurance hurdles. What is your roadmap? And talk to me about the importance of setting the highest standards in your industry. Yeah. So here's the thing. Here's a little, little known secret that most people don't know. Now, most people think that the people that provide education, the doctors, are the friendly form of sales rep, right? You've probably been to your doctor, you've seen the reps come in, sometimes they bring lunch, they might bring some coffee and donuts. But what people don't actually realize is pharmaceutical companies use an elite force. I call them the Navy SEAL force of the pharmaceutical industry called medical science liaisons. And these are people that actually have advanced clinical scientific degrees. They're MDs, they're PhDs like me, or pharmacists. And when they go in to talk to a doctor, they're talking to them at a peer-to-peer -peer level. And so what we do at the ACMA, what our stance has been is that we need to accredit and certify those individuals that are going in and educating doctors to make sure they meet certain competency standards. Before we existed, this was not around. There was right. no standards in place. And I always give the example of, you know, if you were to go to the hairdresser today, Imagine your hairdresser was never trained, never had a license, and was just you know there to cut hair. That just doesn't happen, right? So even in a field like you know the hairstyle and hairdressing field, we have a license, we have standards, we have training. But in the pharma industry, for the people that are out facilitating research and education in the medical community, nothing existed. And that's crazy. Yeah, and and interestingly enough, that now that you have a program like this. You, you have the ability to, to be able to see both sides and to, to really make the decision of the, the programs that need to go in place to keep the standards at the highest level to protect the American public ultimately, because like you said, it all comes down to knowledge and knowledge is power. So what you provide is, is really priceless. Let's move on to cannabis flower. A lot of listeners and viewers are emailing me about this. So According to recent studies, Dr. William, um, cannabis flower may be effective in providing immediate relief. And immediate is the key word here for symptoms of depression. And depression is a condition affecting roughly one in five adults currently in the U.S. And depression, we know, leads to other ailments like cancer and diabetes and cardiovascular disease. What do you say to this? Are you a proponent of the age old plant? And what is your point of view on these alternative treatments? 
So I, I think the data is still out. There's a lot of studies that have been done, you know, not very well studied, not very well designed studies. And there is actually a correlation between low dose marijuana use or cannabis use in treating, like you mentioned, certain forms of mental illness, like depression, bipolar disorder, anxiety, et cetera. However, there's also the opposite. There's a correlation to the use of cannabis at higher doses with causing anxiety and depression and even potentially bipolar disorder and schizophrenia. So that's a that's not actually a very well-known fact, I think, among the public, but misuse of marijuana at higher doses can actually trigger these mental uh, illnesses. And so it has a very, what we call in science, a very narrow therapeutic window, meaning that you got to be careful at what, where you dose it for Absolutely. certain illnesses. Yeah, without a doubt. Everything comes down to microdosing and making sure that you are doing this in a responsible way. And by means of comparison, conventional pharmaceuticals used for the treatment of symptoms of depression normally take several weeks or even months to start causing significant relief. And the potential side effects associated with these traditional pharma products include a lot of terrible things like sedation, anxiety, anorgasmia, even suicidal ideation. But one of the more interesting findings from this Yale study is that cannabis flower with relatively high levels of THC is particularly associated with immediate reductions in the intensity of depressive feelings and doesn't take that long to kick in. So it's definitely something to look at. Now let's move on to CBD. So CBD is an essential component of medical marijuana and it's derived from the hemp plant. Now it's being touted as an effective treatment option for conditions like childhood epilepsy. And even beyond that, we now have magic mushrooms curing alcoholism, or they seem to be an effective uh, pathway to treating alcoholism. Uh, they believe that the psilocybin oriented therapy is proving useful in treating other addictions, even such as cigarette smoking and abuse of cocaine and opioids. Why the sudden increase in plant based cures, Dr. Solomon? Yeah, so look, I, I think that to your point, people are weary uh, about traditional pharmaceuticals, but I think what's important for your audience to know is from the perspective of the Food and Drug Administration, they did issue a report on this and emphasize the fact that there really is not comprehensive research to understand completely the therapeutic effects of CBD, for example, in situations like childhood epilepsy and other areas like that. And I think people have to understand there's the potential safety risks as well, like liver injury, things like that. So. I think the jury's still out on the data. I wouldn't, you know, say anything conclusively in terms of the effects of cannabis medicinally in these different ailments. Yeah, yeah. With no end, listen, with no end to the depression epidemic in sight and given the limitations and potential severe side effects of, of some of the conventional antidepressant medications. I mean, there is a real need for people wanting alternative treatment options, natural, safe, and effective. Uh, and mushrooms and cannabis at this point right now have been touted to check all three boxes. But I, like you, as a mom, I, I want science-based evidence before I just turn that up, right? All right. So we're going to cut to a commercial break. Uh, I wanted to thank you for coming on. We're going to come back and talk biosimilar and, and biologics. I know that's a big proponent of what you do, but I just wanted to thank you for coming on. We'll be right back. William, it was a pleasure having you. Yeah, thank you for having me. That was my Healthy Minutes segment brought to you by Revere Securities. Check out the amazing Dr. William Solomon, chairman and CEO of the ACMA. You're listening to A Moment of Zen right here on 710 WOR, the voice of New York, iHeartRadio. We'll be right back after this. A Moment of Zen is brought to you by Revere Securities. Revere is committed to building a relationship of trust in which they work closely with you to help you define your objectives, explore alternatives, and choose the financial and investment strategies that are most appropriate for you. Go to reveresecurities.com. Welcome back, my beautiful friends. You're listening to A Moment of Zen right here on 710 WOR, the voice of New York, iHeartRadio. Welcoming back to my Healthy Minutes segment brought to you by Revere Securities. We have the amazing Dr. William Solomon, chairman and CEO of the ACMA. Welcome back, my friend. Thanks again, Zen. Thanks for having me. All right, let's chat how ACMA is helping professionals stay compliant. So you work with pharmaceutical, biotech, medical device, and diagnostic companies. Let's chat biosimilars and biologics. And I'm going to map this out for our listeners and viewers. So a biosimilar product is a biologic product that is approved 
based on demonstrating that it is highly similar to an FDA approved biologic product known as a reference product. Now for reference, biosimilars and reference biologics are created in living cells and require significant expertise in state-of-the-art technology in development and manufacturing. And so maintaining an influential role in the life sciences industry requires comprehensive knowledge of both biologics and biosimilars. Additionally, biosimilar job opportunities are expected to increase significantly, granting aspiring life science professionals opportunities to join an expanding industry and to meet a missing demand, ACMA, the Accreditation Council for Medical Affairs, has developed a board-certified biologics and biosimilars specialist program. Talk to me more about this amazing opportunity and why this program is so important. So I am really excited about this one. Like you mentioned, biosimilars are becoming mainstream in terms of their usage clinically among physicians. And so nowadays, with the advent of specialty products like biologics and biosimilars, there's a big educational gap. People don't fully understand how to use these products in clinical practice. And so what we're doing is we're offering the opportunity to develop, uh, you know, folks that can become experts in this area. Biosimilars are really important too, because ultimately what biosimilars can help do is drive down drug expenditure. It's actually predicted that you can be able to reduce the cost of overall drug expenditure in the next six years by over $20 million. And that's huge. Um, you know, the fact of the matter is there's a lot of current regulatory standards by the government, a lot of legislative laws in place to help support more education for biologics and biosimilars among healthcare providers. So I think the next few years, you're going to see a lot of more advancement, expansion of biosimilars, more about how these things get reimbursed in the pharmacy setting, more learning about interchangeability between biological and biosimilars. So we're very excited about it. And we're the first to bring something like this to the industry. So it is really something that's cutting edge and it's the first time it's ever happened. So I expect we're already seeing a massive amount of interest among the life sciences community and the healthcare community in the program. So excited to see what happens in a few weeks. Yeah, definitely a niche market. When you Google, in fact, biologics and biosimilars, ACMA pops up right there because you're right. There's just the market has a huge void and it's interesting that you picked up on this, but that's why you do what you do. You are the founder of such a great organization for a reason. So I think people should be really excited about this one, especially in the pharmaceutical mm -hmm. industry. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Yeah, it's an exciting time. The program will launch in mid-November. November 15th is actually the official day for the launch of the Biologics and Biosimilar Certification. I love it. Well, we're out of time. Thank you so much for coming on. Always insightful to have you on, my friend. Thank you very much for having me. That was my Healthy Minutes segment brought to you by Revere Securities. Definitely check out the amazing Dr. William Solomon, Chairman and CEO of Accreditation Council for Medical Affairs, ACMA. Definitely head to their website, medicalaffairsspecialist.org. You're listening to A Moment of Zen right here on 710 WOR, the voice of New York iHeartRadio. We'll be right back after this.